This Dig Dialogue with Marissa Meyer is brought to you by Sony. It's a piece of me. It's a piece of me. Make a fresh splash. TV and Internet, together at last. Sony Internet TV, the world's first HD TV powered by Google TV. She's frequently identified as one of the most powerful women in the world. As Google's 20th employee and first female engineer, Marissa Meyer has been responsible for leading and developing products including Google Search, Gmail, Maps, and Earth, just to name a few. Last month, she was named to Google's operating committee and placed in charge of all geographic and local services. Marissa now joins veteran technology journalist Patrick Norton to answer the top questions from the Dig community. This is Dig Dialogue with Marissa Meyer. Welcome to the latest, the 22nd episode of Dig Dialogue. I'm Patrick Norton for Dig Dialogue. Joining us today, tech luminary Marissa Meyer, Google employee number 20. She's seen it all, ladies and gentlemen, and recently taken on the role of Vice President, Location and Local Services of Google. Pleasure to meet you, Marissa, and my apologies for not having your title memorized. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's exciting times at Google right now. Yes, there's a lot going on. It's never dull. <laughs> I, I should say welcome back. This is your second Dig Dialogue. This is, this is a, and I, I got to say, for all the questions we have, I know you're excited to talk about Google TV, some of the location products, what's going on. Uh, we've got a lot of questions from the Dig crew. Let me take a moment to remind everybody at home how Dig Dialogue works. These are not my questions. These are from the millions of members of the Dig user community. They've submitted them. They've dug them up. We're going to take the top 10 off the pile. I'm going to read the question. We're going to identify the user, talk about the number of digs it got. And we got to start with one that wasn't actually in the top 10. Um, but I think a lot of folks are curious. Jared Schwartz, what was it like to have President Obama in your home? Did you guys talk about anything cool? Uh, we did. It was actually really wonderful to have him there. He was there for about an hour and a half to two hours, mm -hmm. uh, talking to about 60 people. Uh, and one of the really fun facts, I think, of course, being a geek, mm -hmm. is that I live on the same street that the HP garage is on, <laughs> which is on Addison Avenue in Palo Alto, and it's about 10 houses away. And so you know, I brought up the fact that you know, we're right here in the heart of Silicon Valley, where the startup culture, the startup in a garage, was really born. No, absolutely. And, uh, and President Obama managed to work that into his talking points. And then we spent a lot of time, at least at our table, because then he joined each table for a conversation, talking about technology, talking about jobs, talking about how innovation can really change the future. This is a good thing. What, what was security like? I mean, did you have Secret Service in your home days before, like vacuuming uh, well, everything? Well, <laughs> we didn't actually know where he was going to be. So for a while, it was actually planned to be uh, at my apartment in San Francisco. And then mm -hmm. because the San Francisco Giants are going, <laughs> they've been doing so well, go Giants. Uh, people got really concerned about the traffic patterns up in the city. And or so, lack thereof, <laughs> since everything stopped for the last two weeks. Exactly. They don't like the president to be stopped, as you can imagine. So about three days uh, before the event, they suddenly said, hey, can we do it in Palo Alto mm -hmm. instead? And about 35 people in suits showed up, including a person who introduced himself as the rooftop sniper. Awesome. <laughs> Just how my Monday morning started out. <laughs> like, I was like, I don't know if that's a good or a bad Is there a neighbor you don't? Like, <laughs> shoot in that direction, the guy with the lawn ornament. So, hmm. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. So we're going to start out with kind of an easy one. Number 10 on the list, Jason Young, 25 digs. How do you think the Sony Internet TV with Google will change the way people watch TV and go online? Well, I think what's really great about Google TV is that you actually can preserve your television watching experience. You can mm -hmm. be watching a show. Uh, so maybe you're watching a show on stocks, and you can actually get the stock tickers on the side. You can be watching the baseball game while getting the tweets on the side. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can integrate both a full browser experience as well as applications and gadgets mm -hmm. uh, into your overall experience really means that television is no longer sort of a one-to-many broadcast mm -hmm. experience. It's still one-to-many. We still think it's part of the living room, but it's much more 
interactive and it's much more adaptive. And I think that, especially with the overall progression of technology, people over time really do expect personalization mm -hmm. and interactivity. And this is a very personal, interactive way to watch television. Is this going to become sort of another Android device where we can really, really customize it in terms of application and interface? Yes, that's the idea. And in fact, even the early versions already have that. It's a start. What is he designing? The <laughs> phones are a little bit ahead of Google TV. The, the, Mr. Brian Ware writes in five digs, how do you feel the Sony Internet TV or Google TV, I should say, will change the online advertising space? Well, I think that this is really an opportunity to understand what users want, how mm -hmm. they want to customize it. And part of that customized experience is advertising. Mm -hmm. What are your watching habits? What types of things are you interested in? What do you want to look at alongside mm -hmm. uh, your television? And so maybe there will be things like product placement, where you see a product <laughs> in a particular show, and then you see an advertisement alongside it. Would you like it. to buy a hat? <laughs> Click here. <laughs> and I think that also the fact that you actually understand the user's habits over time mm -hmm. in terms of what they're watching means you might be able to show something that was related to something they just watched or watched a week ago. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of get that type of reintroduction and ongoing relationship with the user. So I think that we, while we're still very early, mm -hmm. uh, we're just exploring a lot of different possibilities. These are some of the things that I think hold a lot of promise. Can we throw out one of the paranoid questions about Google TV? Yanko, 1975, uh, a mere eight digs, but a lot of people are curious. I'm worried about how Google TV will be monetized now and in the future. Where will the creepy line be drawn for Google TV? What will and won't be shared? How will Google protect user anonymity? or anonymity, as people who speak English say it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, is, how, I, you, you, can, you can share data, you can hide data. How much is Google TV going to know? Will it know everything about your viewing habits? Well, our philosophies on all things related mm -hmm. to privacy are, is always around transparency, mm -hmm. choice, and control. So you can see what information we have, you mm -hmm. can see how we use it, and you can control it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, sometimes with other DVRs, people will say, you know, where do these recommendations come from? Like, you know, what do they think of me? What do they know about me? Right? Our goal is to be as transparent mm -hmm. uh, with the data that we have as possible, and Google TV adheres to those principles. It's a good thought. Plus, also, when you realize you have like a 16-year-old and grandma using the same television as the rest of the family, you can have widely divergent viewing habits, which can make for some peculiar recommendations. Sure, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> so we do, we do encourage people to just generally use good mm -hmm. online sensibilities. So signing in and out, especially if you're you know, watching by yourself. And, uh, you know, Caveat emptor. <laughs> All right, let's, we have one of the tough ones here. Hockey Giant 2 this is number one on the list with 95 digs. The last time you came on Dig Dialogue, you said the upcoming product you were most excited for was Google Wave. How do you feel now that Wave is ceasing development? I think that Wave has been a really interesting project. And mm -hmm. I still think that technologically, uh, and from a product standpoint, it did many interesting things. Mm -hmm. I think the ability to embed waves in blogs was really interesting. I think the actual real-time typing, I mean, how much time do we all spend each day mm -hmm. looking at our IM windows saying so-and-so is typing? Right. <laughs> Wouldn't it be just nice if you could see the first half of what they said and just be like, I know what you're going to say already. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so I mean, I think that it did some very nice product uh, things and some very nice interface, uh, it has some very nice interface elements and integration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think that one of the big things that we do at Google is we try and launch early and iterate and learn from mm -hmm. both our successes and our failures. And I think here, you know, this is really about what can we, we learn from Wave, and we've learned a lot. Does it, you know, does it come back in the future as another product? Does it sort of the pieces and components show up in other places like Gmail or other interfaces? As I said, I think there were a lot of really good ideas mm -hmm. in Wave, and so I think it would be really interesting to think about how could some of these be deployed in other contexts. Cool. Number two, Confucius say with 88 digs, if you were to give Kevin Rose and the new CEO advice about getting dig back on track after the site suffered from one of the worst site relaunches in Web 2.0 history, I'd like to disagree with that because I've seen a lot of Web 2.0 launches, but what would that advice be? Uh, I mean, I think that, that Kevin and the team at Dig have done overall a really good job. And it's really tough uh, when you have a you know, rocky release with your users. But it really is about focusing on the users, mm -hmm. trying to get focused about what do they want, how are they reacting, how can you adapt. 
right? It's, uh, it's, you know, kind of like a rebound, right? It's not right. the fall that matters, it's the bounce, <laughs> right? And, and so how you respond and how you react and making sure you get a good bounce off of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, people will, companies will make missteps. Like even if you look at Apple, right? They, <laughs> they had the Newton, they had eWorld, right? I mean, they, they, didn't, they didn't hit everything out of the park. <laughs> and, you know, that said, like a lot of it is how do you reinvent right. yourself? How do you pick up? How do you learn from that? In particular, mm -hmm. how do you learn from your users? All right. Number three, six way stop, 77 digs. Marissa, you were the 20th employee and the first female engineer when you joined Google back in 1999. You must clearly understand what Google stands for better than almost anyone else at Google. So I wonder, why does Google find it so important to experiment in new industries like energy or transportation when the company's mission statement has always been, quote, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, unquote. How would programs such as self-driving cars or social gaming fit under this umbrella? And do you think that these recent projects or acquisitions signify a change in Google's overall mission? I think that Larry and Sergey, when they started the company, were really interested in taking computer science mm -hmm. and applying it to very hard everyday problems that could really change lives. And I think that our mission statement to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful mm -hmm. is open to really broad interpretation. And so when you think about some of these things like cars that drive themselves, this is really, in many ways, a search and information problem. Mm -hmm. How do you get the right information to the car? How do you sense where other cars are? How do you sense your surroundings? How do you sense traffic? How do you sense weather? And, and actually how to process all that information In real time. to make sure <laughs> that the car makes the right decision. Mm -hmm. Right, which I mean, search is about getting people the right information so they make the right decision. This is very much uh, the same type of thing, and there's and there's lots of inputs. So just like there's lots of information on the web, there's lots of inputs coming into the card in order to really drive it accurately. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our goal really is to take technology, some of these new ideas and and uh, revolutionary thoughts, and really apply them to hard problems. And if we could actually help people drive their cars or not drive their cars <laughs> I think better not, and more safely, well, you know, that's a huge everyday problem. That's a huge, I mean, do you see that being productized by Google? Do you see Google licensing that technology? Is it all far too early in the, I mean, it's I just, it's, I, we drive around, <laughs> I know how people drive around here, so I'm excited by the idea of cars driving for people at least in the Bay Area. Well, um, I know I know how I drive, and I don't drive very well. <laughs> you know, I always heard that someone said that 95% of people consider themselves above average drivers. <laughs> so if you assume accurate self-perception of driving ability, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm clearly one of the worst drivers. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. But that said, I think it's way too early okay. to think about how we would actually productize this. I had to ask, you know, you never know what's going to come out. So number four, Forever Zero, 51 digs. What do you think Google's biggest mistake has been during your time there? I think that you know one of the things that we do at Google is experiment, launch early and often, and iterate. And so part of that process is about making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about, you know, Wave certainly there were things that we've learned from that. There are things that we would have done differently. Uh, I think that there are you know other things when I look back where, for example, shutting down Deja News. Uh, at 11 a.m. on a Monday morning <laughs> and not really having any way to post to or browse. News groups was perhaps a mistake. Launching Gmail on April Fool's Day, which was widely misinterpreted. I <laughs> like, you know, we've made, we've had made some mistakes along the way, but our goal really is to learn from them and mm -hmm. to accept that you know, making mistakes really is part of the overall process. And it's really how do you learn from those mistakes? What do you learn from your users mm -hmm. through that? And how do you make your product even better the next time? Back to a good bounce then. Yeah. I always thought the Gmail launch on April 1st was intentional and a sign of intense internal humor at Google. It was. OK. <laughs> and then the whole rest of the world kind of misunderstood it. Oh, look, it's a hoax. So as I said, so it, wasn't, it wasn't a mistake as we planned it. It was just a mistake <laughs> now it executed. Perception <laughs> is tough. Mm -hmm. Number five, Chevy Chase 12, 45 digs. What's the difference between the Google TV and other TVs that are already highlighting internet access and apps? Well, I think that one of the really important things to realize about Google TV is it gives you a full internet browser. 
So it introduces Chrome, mm -hmm. and you actually can access anything on the web. So rather than being inside of a walled garden or a limited internet experience, it's a mm -hmm. full internet experience. So one, you can go to do that inside of your browser, but you can also introduce all kinds of gadgets and relevant mm -hmm. materials. So for example, on say CNBC, if mm -hmm. they're talking about stocks, they're now looking at how can they take gadgets mm -hmm. and bring those and or recommend those to people who are watching the show on a Google TV. So it's a really integrated experience. So we're working with the, the actual producers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of these shows to make sure we've got relevant content. And we also want to make sure that the user has full customizability and full internet access. It's also kind of nice that it's it's a single platform rather than having to develop into individual 17 different platforms by 18 different television vendors. Not that I'm bitter about that development process <laughs> at any level. Well, and it's also, it's built on, on Android. And so, you know, it's a really nice platform and people know how to develop it for it. And so there's a lot of consistency there. How long before more Android apps? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we know we have a really great Android uh, apps uh, on marketplace where you can go ahead and get apps <laughs> for your phone. And so we're excited to build that out. Come on, come on. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number six, Sorend RD, 41 digs. What would you have done if you were the CEO of Dig pre version four? There's a couple more Dig questions, I think. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think that what Dig has done for news on the web is really mm -hmm. pretty amazing. I think that the democratization of it, the mm -hmm. way that it disseminates information, the community around it, the way that news gets discussed, mm -hmm. I think is actually really important. I think that all of those attributes, what, what the internet has done for, for news, what Dig has done for news, mm -hmm. is is really key, and I think it's important not to lose sight of, of what Dig has done in terms of disseminating that information mm -hmm. and really giving a lot of people a voice in the current events of today. Cool. So that's to say you're not going to comment on how you would have handled version four of <laughs> Dig. I, it's a follow-up question. I think, I think it's hard to know, until, right. unless, you're, you know, unless you're there and you're doing the user studies and you know, there's also, because Dig is such a social site, there's mm -hmm. an entirely social component. There's an right? intense there, relationship know. between the audience and, and well, the product. You know, we like to do split A-B testing at Google mm -hmm. and usually in split A-B testing you can predict how users will mm -hmm. respond, but sometimes there in fact is a social response, <laughs> which you can't really do an experiment for. So I think some of these things are difficult, so again, it really is about how do you learn, how do you pick up and find the next step. Everything's simple until it reaches the internet and then you <laughs> learn a lot. Addison, 32 digs. Do you ever think Google will build a cool spaceship? <laughs> um, I mean, it's hard to say. You know, we are uh, participating uh, with XPRIZE in the Lunar XPRIZE. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we certainly hope that somebody builds a cool spaceship. <laughs> uh, whether or not uh, it will be us, I don't know. But I think that, again, we're really interested mm -hmm. in technologies, that we tend to focus more on the software side and like <laughs> dealing with vast amounts of information. But you know, we're tackling cars, so who knows? <laughs> so envisioning like Google branding on the outside of, a, of an XPRIZE winner at this point, you find where you're going. Number Number eight, Jason Jung, 29 digs. What is the one gadget you cannot live without? Well, I think I can't, I, there's a lot of gadgets I can't live without, so that's pretty tough. Um, I would say from a practical matter, uh, I think that my Verizon EVDO card that lets me connect to the internet anywhere is really important. Like I just more and more have gotten used to of course, They're you can addictive. Get, you start of using course it, you can get use to the internet from then, anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I actually <laughs> spent, you know, and believe it or not, you really can. Like, I actually spent uh, a week this summer or a few days this summer mm -hmm. walking up Kilimanjaro, and you can get the internet on Kilimanjaro. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Actually, there's like, usually like, and all, and you know, the various guides all know the spot, so you'll see the guides all going out to the spot. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's not everywhere, but you can get the internet almost everywhere. So for me, the Verizon EVDO card is really about getting internet everywhere. Mm -hmm. you, and, you know, it works in. Basements, it works in buildings, it works in faraway places you wouldn't expect. Uh, but I also think that um, smartphones, so I have an iPhone, I have obviously I have some Android phones, uh, and I use them all, and I do think that the applications, the ease of information use, uh, you know, it really is something. It's where, like something out of science fiction. Yeah. Like, I, you can, mm -hmm. you, could you have imagined your phone doing everything it, it did 20 years? Well, you might, but you probably are thinking in longer event horizons than most people. Well, I think, I think that, I don't know if I could have predicted these things, but I do think the expectation of broadband access or mm -hmm. very good internet access being almost everywhere is something that I've come to really depend on. Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised when I can't get to the internet. And I do think that how applications work, how you can basically say, okay, well, there's this service that I use and the service that I use, and I can also hop on the web and use Google whenever I want, Google Maps, 
all of these types of things are things that uh, you know it's now pretty hard to imagine living without. Is there, is there ever a moment where you're, where you're kind of contemplating that we're going to cover the entire globe with internet access and maybe there's nowhere to hide and that might be a bad thing? Well, I actually heard a really interesting uh, comment once by Bill Joy. You know, mm -hmm. So he's just this wonderful tech thought leader. And he said this thing, and I think it's true, and actually the fact that it, the EVDO cards you know, run through the cell phone carriers is interesting. But he, his theory was that internet access will always be a necessary subset mm -hmm. of telephone and cell phone access. That basically it's, unth it's kind of unthinkable that there would be somewhere in the world where the internet would work, mm -hmm. but your phone wouldn't. Right. And of course now that you know, voicemail's dead and, and phone calls are dying, I don't know what that means, but at least in today's day and age, I think that it is, I think that's still mm -hmm. true, that you know, networks are hard to build. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why when we get internet access, you know, we, we get it through our phones or, or through cable. Mm -hmm. And so you know, relying on those networks is probably likely, which does mean that internet access will usually be a subset. I like that. But thought. now phones are almost everywhere, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's satellite phone systems, but uh, let's not go on that tangent. Number nine, VTAG, 26 digs. Do you see privacy being an issue for family shared televisions once Twitter and Facebook accounts are integrated into the TV stream? Well, I think that I know our goal here is to follow one of a family shared computer. Mm -hmm. And so the same way family members share a computer, there will be some general preferences mm -hmm. that can be shared across everyone. Mm -hmm. But for more personal viewing, you will want to sign in or sign out. And I, that said, I do think there probably will be cases where people will have, say, a shared family Twitter account, right? And, and they'll have ways of, of working with this. If you don't want the kids to watch The Sopranos, you can disable that, you can have it on your account, keep it separate. Take responsibility for your own viewing habits then? Yeah. I like that mm -hmm. thought. Let's say, can we, do you mind if we end on a kind of a ridiculous one? Sure. Okay. Uh, as somebody that imme I immediately joked on Twitter when I saw the, the Google car driving itself uh, that I never really expected Google to give birth to Skynet to make a Terminator reference. Um, Griff asks, when Google becomes Skynet, can we come to your underground bunker? Do you see uh, artificial intelligence and robots in Google's future? I'd say AI is already here if the cars can drive themselves on the highway, but... <laughs> Uh, well, I don't think that Google is Skynet, though that said, <laughs> <laughs> we are working on massive amounts of information and trying mm -hmm. to help build intelligence, be it in cars or into our search or into our maps or recommendations. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's re our goal really is to help people be smarter, not necessarily help computers be smarter, though that may be a necessary a side, side effect. effect. <laughs> Very good. Marissa, thank you so much for taking thank the time you. to talk to us on Dig Dialogue and answer the questions, obviously, from the Dig community. Folks, remember, you can all go to dig.com slash dialogue to watch all the Dig Dialogues in the series. I'm Patrick Norton. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>